doing today? Hey, thank you for having me. Great. I think I'm sharing my slides, correct? That's looking great. Oh, uh, uh, maybe actually, is there a way to go uh, without the, to hide the um, menu bar at the top or no? Let's figure that out. Let's try again. Brave tab. Mm -mm, that's out of scope. Share. That's ah, better, perfect. Right? That's wonderful. That's gr that's great. Yeah. Um, helps for people. I'm sure there'll be lots of people taking screenshots of um, your slide deck as they go. Uh, okay, yeah. great. I'll leave you to it, Sam. Cheers. Okay, thank you, Mark. Um, so, hey, everybody. Um, thank you for sticking around. I think this is the last talk before lunch. Even though you could have lunch in front of your computer, I'm still very thankful that you are sticking around. Um, so the title of this talk is That's Out of Scope because initially I wanted to talk a lot about scopes, um, that being the auth to scopes. Um, but while, while building this talk, I realized I wanted to talk about the whole picture of access management. So the next 20 some minutes are going to be about access control um, or access management. But let me flex, firstly quickly introduce myself. So um, as introduced, my name is Sam Bellen and I'm a developer advocate engineer at Auth0. Um, if you've never heard of Auth0 before, perfectly fine. Uh, we're an identity as a service provider, which basically means that we try to make it as easy as possible for anybody to implement a secure authentication so you can focus on building your actual applications themselves. I'm also a Google developer expert and you can find me on the internet as Sam Bego. Uh, we have a booth. So if you're interested in Alt Zero, uh, feel free to stop by the booth today um, and we will uh, gladly talk to you. So a summary of this talk, I would like to talk a bit about attribute-based access control, then go to role-based access control, and lastly, talk about permissions via scopes because that's what's in the title and that's still something that I get a lot of questions about when to use permissions or scopes and what is the difference between the both of them. So let's get started. Access control. Firstly, let's define what access control is, or at least what I understand with access control. Um, and I've tried to condense it all into one little sentence, which is access control is the art of regulating who can do what on your system. So it's defining who can do certain things on your system. Certain people might have different rights or access rights or roles or permissions than others. Um, so by defining all of that, um, that's what I understand with access control. The first one, attribute-based access control, um, also sometimes known as policy-based access control. And it basically says so in the name. It relies on a bunch of attributes to, def to define who can access what. This can be user-based attributes, environmental-based attributes, some attributes of the resource, um, and maybe some actions, um, some different type of actions might get you some different outcomes. So what are user-based attributes, something like the, the role of the user. I'm a developer advocate. Um, an engineer might have different role ex roles or permissions, um, and a CTO or CEO might have some different ones as well. Um, the organization, I'm part of the marketing organization, but maybe the engineering organization might have some different permissions as well. And security cl clearance is another one that is a user attribute. Next up, environmental attributes. The time of day, is it during your working hours? Is it in the middle of the night? Might give you a different outcome. Um, the location of the data you're trying to access. Um, if I'm trying to access something in Asia, maybe something's fishy because I'm based in Europe and maybe I should not be accessing uh, data in Asia. And maybe at the moment your uh, organization or your company is being DDoSed or under attack. So the current threat level might be higher, which means that not everybody should get the same access to the same resources as usual. The resource, the actual thing you're trying to work with, when is it created, who owns it, um, does it contain sensitive data? All these attributes might also change the outcome of who can access that resource. And last up, the action. Not everybody might be able to read, write, delete, and so forth. So perform uh, a different kind of different set of actions on the resource itself. So if you take an example, any engineer can write to any file if you are currently not experiencing a DDoS attack. This is an example that contains a few of these attributes. First one, any engineer, that's a user attribute. Next up, write, it's an action. Um, any file is a resource, basically any file, any resource in this case. And not experiencing DDoS attack is something related to the environment. It's our current threat level. Now you don't have to have all four of these attributes um, present, but you can mix and match them and combine them all together 
to form a very strong policy. Another example, an accountant can upload an invoice if it's during their working hours. Again, the accountant is a role, so it's a user attribute. Upload is an action. An invoice is a resource and during their working hours is something related to the environment, the time of day. And lastly, an HR representative can look up personal details if the subject is part of their local branch. You guess it by now, but an HR representative is something related to the user, a user attribute. Look up, to look up is an action. Personal details, details are some kind of resource and is part of the local branch is something environmentally related. Um, so this means that an HR representative cannot access personal details, details of somebody who works in another office or in another branch. And this means that attribute-based access control allows for a very fine-grained control over all possible actions on your infrastructure. Just because you can mix and match all of these attributes, maybe use one or two, maybe use all four, maybe use a lot more than that, um, but it's very fine-grained. Um, you can you get very fine-grained control over all possible actions. This also means that depending on your ar architecture or your organization, this might be a bit overkill. Just because there's so many combinations, it might be too much to implement for your organization, for your system. So it might just be too, too much of a hassle to start with attribute-based access control. So there's another alternative for that, which is RBAC, role-based access control. Um, which basically means that a user has one or more roles. Um, doesn't have to be one, can be multiple roles. And uh, these roles can be an admin, an engineer, can be something related to your job title. Um, doesn't matter as long as a role describes a, uh, a role of a user. And a role has one or more permissions. So a role can have one or multiple permissions and you can then um, assign these roles to users, which means that you can assign one or more uh, permissions at once to a user based on the roles. Some permissions, read a resource, write to a resource, delete a resource, basically perform an action on a certain resource. And you can find this very strictly um, as per kind of resource, or you can do this very broadly. Also depends on your infrastructure, on your architecture, depends on your organization. So in the example we had before, a guest is able to read all documentation because a guest is somebody that usually just uh, needs to do a very simple task, like reading the documentation of your product. Well, an engineer is able to read the documentation, but since he's building the product, it also has the rights to edit the documentation. And somebody with the admin role should be able to read, edit, and delete all documentation. And this gets implemented in a few different ways. Sometimes you mix and match the admin and engineering role, which means that the engineer has the read and write um, permissions and the admin gets the extra delete one. And sometimes you add all permissions to the admin role, you just apply the admin role. Personal preference, or maybe your, your infrastructure, architecture, or um, just the way you work in your company. So if you look at an example for Alt0, we have uh, role-based access control built into our product. So you can just create a role based when you click on that big orange button. In this example, I've created a premium and a user role. And the user can just do the, the normal things. It can create an advertisement on this, this application. And let's say this is an application where you can um, sell secondhand clothes. So you can create an advertisement for each of your clothes you want to sell. And a normal user can create them and read them. But you also sell a premium subscription, which lets them do a little bit more, which is to promote that advertisement. So when a user pays, they get the premium role. Um, when they don't pay, when they just have the free subscription, they use the regular user role. And I might've just put the promote role, uh, permission in this premium role and apply this to my regular user. Um, again, that's personal prefer preference or the way you build your apps or APIs. Um, and if you would like to figure out a role of a user, oftentimes you'll just go to your API, your authorization server, and use, you enter the user ID and you ask for which permissions does this user have. Sometimes you might ask for the roles as well, um, but you use the API to figure this out. But at out zero, um, as I said, we have a role-based access control baked in. If you enable this in the settings, you can also add the permissions to the access token which means that you don't really have to do that separate call to your API. 
to figure out the permissions of a user, the permissions will be inside of the access token, which will be a JSON web token. So if we look inside the payload of the JSON web token, there's going to be a whole bunch related to the, J the, the, the access token itself, and also the permissions that the current user has, in this case, to read, create, and promote an advertisement. So should you check permissions or roles on your API replication? That's a very difficult question and it really depends on how complex you want to make it. Um, I like to check permissions because it gives me a bit more flexibility. And then if in the future, um, some permissions get added to a role or removed from a role or an extra role gets added, it allows me to quickly do this without breaking my application. But if you have a very simple application with let's say an admin and a regular role, it's sometimes easier to just check for roles if role is admin. Um, and then do certain things or don't do, don't do certain things. So I'd like to say that permissions are a bit more future-proof, um, a bit more fine-grained, um, while roles are the easiest way to get started. So as I mentioned in the introduction, permissions versus scopes. And this is a question that I get a lot. What do I actually use when using OAuth or OpenID Connect? Do I just use uh, permissions? Do I use scopes? What is the difference between those two things? Um, so let's figure that out. The definition of a scope by the auth um, documentation is scope is a mechanism in auth 2.0 that, that to limit an application's access to a user's account. An application can request one or more scopes. This information is then presented to the user in the, content, in the consent screen and the access token issued to the application will be limited to the scopes granted. Um, so if you take a few of the, the important things out of this, it can limit an application's access. It's from the OAuth 2.0 um, documentation, so it's obviously something introduced by OAuth 2.0. Um, it is presented to the user in the consent screen, which means that the user will have to consent to you giving those um, permissions to an external application. Um, and the access token will be granted um, only with the limit of the scopes that the user has granted access to. So in short, Scopes are permissions granted by the user to a third party when using the Auth2 or the OpenID Connect framework, just because OpenID Connect is just uh, built on top of the uh, fundamental, the basics of Auth2.0. So scopes are permissions basically, um, but they're granted by the user to a third party. And that's a very important thing to remember. They're granted by a third party and granted by the user. So if we look at a little delegation scenario, a scenario where we use a third party where we want to get permissions uh, from the user. I use, let's say a user wants to import all contacts from their Gmail account. So you have an application that allows users to import all contacts from a Gmail account. The application is going to request contacts that we don't need, that scope is, that's a scope that Google uses to uh, get access to all contacts. Um, and once you request that scope with the Google API, a user will have to authenticate and then approve or deny the requested scopes. So the user, the user has the choice to approve or deny that scope. Um, this, uh, will, this will be in the form of this uh, consent screen. I think all of us have seen this before, um, but it basically says, see and download your contacts. And this is what the user gets to see for all the scopes that you requested with an external service, this being Google in this instance. And when you click allow, the application can import all contacts if the user approved the scope. So if the user did not approve the scope, your access token will not have access to those contacts. Um, but if they, if they approved it, you will be able to get access to the contacts and import them into your system. So if we put it side by side, permissions are a general authentication of authorization concept. You see them in a lot of different frameworks. Um, well, scopes are something that is um, introduced by Auth 2.0 and also available in OpenID Connect. Permissions are first party, um, not only first party, but also first party, which means if you just want to check if a user has a permission on your own system, your first party, um, you don't need to use scopes at all. You can just check um, the permissions of your user on your authorization server. Well, if you want to get permissions on a third party, an external service, you might want to use scopes if they use OpenID Connect or Auth 2.0. A permission is granted to a user, either by your admin, your webmaster, or your system, while a scope is granted by the user. The user has to allow you to access that data um, 
And a user usually has no direct control over which rules are assigned to them because they get added by the admin, the webmaster, your system. While a user in a scope scenario can limit what an app can do on behalf of the user. So a user can limit which scopes uh, it will allow for your application. It's also good to notice that um, scopes only can um, give access to the actual permissions that a user has. So it can never give more access than what a user could access in, in, in general. It can limit what it can access, but it can never give you more access or no, more permissions than it, that the user has. Um, and my colleague, Vittorio Bertocci, wrote a very good blog post on, on the nature of Auth2 scopes. So if you want to read a bit more, um, go to auth0.com slash blog and search for scopes or click on this link if you go to these slides later um, and read more about scopes in general. So let's summarize. Attribute-based access control offers a fine-grained control, but it's quite complex and not always necessary. This means that you can mix and match a lot of attributes and form a lot of scenarios in which somebody could or could not access a certain resource based on user attributes, uh, the resource itself, the action, and maybe some env environmental um, attributes like are you under attack at the moment? Um, but this gets quite complex, quite fast, and doesn't always make sense for smaller systems, smaller applications, smaller organizations. Role-based access control defines permissions and assigns them to roles and a user can have multiple roles. So basically you're going to create a lot of roles and assign those roles to the user based on which access they should get to your resources. Um, a user can have multiple roles and then a role can have multiple permissions. And scopes come into play when a delegate in a de with a delegation scenario, but you should not be used for third party for first party APIs. Um, so as long as you're working first party within your own system, just, uh, just ask your authorization server for the permissions or the roles of the user directly. But once you're working in a delegation scenario where you want to um, get access um, to the user's data on a, on a third party, then you might want to use scopes so that the user can give you access or deny you access to certain data um, or certain actions on that third party um, system or that third party service. So, that was it, that was quite short, um, so we can all get to, to food a bit faster. Um, but if you want to see these slides again, you can go to access.sumbigo.tech um, and you'll find these slides again. You can navigate with your keyboard um, or with your uh, swiping on your phone if you want to. If you have any questions after this or later today, um, just come to the Odd Zero booth in the Partners Village or just um, send me a tweet to at Um But I think we also have a bit of time at the moment to answer questions live if somebody has some. That being said, thank you very much for listening. Um, so I don't see Mark joining, but I see in the stage chat that Rui Silva asked, would you say that when is also an important aspect of access control? It would mean that you not only need to know who's accessing what in your system, but also when. And when uh, working with the attributes-based um, access control, it definitely is one of the attributes you can use. It's an environmental attribute, um, the time of day. Um, so when is definitely useful if you want to have a very fine-grained control over who can access what when so it's a very good question Ru. thank you i don't see any more questions um but again if you have any questions feel free to pop into the odd zero booth today um, or send me a tweet at at some video.
got a sticky button, it seems. <laughs> um, sorry, sorry about that. Um, that was fantastic. Thanks um, uh, for the talk. I had to duck away for a second there at, towards the end. Um, I'll just check if the uh, if there's any. So Rui's asking, would you say that when is also an important aspect of access control? It would mean that you not only need to know who is accessing what in your system, but also when. Yeah, so I already asked that, uh, answered oh. that question before you talk, uh, came back. Um, so definitely when is also uh, an important aspect, especially when using attribute-based access control, because it's an event, environmental um, attribute, the time of day or when. Okay, and wonderful. Yeah. Okay, we don't have any more questions, so we'll duck out a little bit early for um, the networking and the expo. So please feel free to check out the Partners Village now. Thanks to all of our speakers in this session uh, and we'll be back at uh, 12 30 for the uh, api design track thanks again sam thanks all of our speakers bye